welcome to our presentation entitled, What Barriers Do Music Students Encounter When Searching? My name is Misty Shaw, and in a few moments, you'll meet my co-presenter, Will Scharfenberger. For almost five years, I have been the Head of Public Services and Outreach at the IU Cook Music Library, which means that I interact a lot with students and music users. Sometimes it feels as though half of the assistance that we give in music reference and circulation consists of saying the following things. Open that, click that, then that, no, not that, there. Oh shoot, no, close that window, go back, click there. No matter how much classroom instruction FaceTime we get, information literacy concepts only get us so far when students are working within the confines of a particular search tool. And so, addressing the barriers that students encounter when seeking information is crucial for me, and I suspect it is for many of us who work in music libraries. When reflecting on my work, I can identify some key barriers that students experience, but I've never formally gathered data directly from music students about how they search and the barriers they encounter. I've never worked in UX in any real capacity. Enter Will Scharfenberger. Will is a full-time public services supervisor in the Cook Music Library, and they regularly serve on the music library instruction team. In a presentation that involved collaboration between catalogers Chuck Peters and Michelle Hahn with user experience librarian Rachel Cohen, Will saw firsthand how gathering user data and working with UX specialists can lead to improvements in the search experience, such as adding music-related enhancements to our library's online catalog. Will set out to design a study, a mixed methods cross-sectional investigation, to observe and record how music students search. And I jumped at the chance to work with Will on this because we share the same pie-in-the-sky goal that maybe this study could lead to enhancements in search tools while also keeping us on our teaching and customer service toes. I should add that neither Will nor I have substantial experience in conducting a search such as this but we do have Andrew Asher. Andrew is our assessment librarian. He's an anthropologist by training who has gained some prominence in the library world by using ethnographic methods to observe student habits. So with Andrew's support and expertise, we're able to pursue this study. In this presentation, we'll describe our study design and method and our protocol, and then share some preliminary findings and analysis. Will is going to discuss the specifics of our study design and protocol, but first I'm going to give you a brief overview of what this study entails so that you have a general framework in which to digest the details. What we did was this. We created six searches for students to complete. Half of the searches were open-ended, for example, using any database you like, try to locate X item. The other half of the searches were dictated for example, using the library's online catalog, try to locate X item. Next, we conducted interviews and observations. Each student participant in the study had an individual appointment with Will in a quiet office. Will asked the students to perform the six searches for music items. Will observed and recorded their searches. And then after interviews were complete, we used in vivo software to analyze the results. At this time, Will is going to describe the protocol, including how they conducted the interviews and search sessions, as well as the questions we asked each student. Hi, I'm Will, and I'll take you under the hood of our study. Let's start with who. We drew what was basically a quota sample from the students in the School of Music. This means that our final list of participants was diverse in a way that we felt like the demographic spectrum was well represented but not necessarily in the same distribution as the School of Music student body. Those factors were non-US domestic students, first-generation college students, degree level, undergraduate, graduate, and doctoral, degree progress, or total time in college, previous degrees, major, performance or academic, instrument, and previous library instruction. We intentionally set a high payout for participation in the study because we knew that would be a good way to get participants who weren't overachievers, which would give us better data in the long run. We knew we wanted about 25 to 30 total participants, so I randomly invited participants from each list until we had a quota for each demographic group. 
In total, I conducted 27 structured interviews, each made up of two parts, some softball questions to get to know their search habits and establish rapport, then six search tasks. Each interview takes about 40 to 60 minutes in all. The search tasks were pulled from real life situations that Missy and I had encountered, either at the reference desk or in music history survey research consultations. The six searches came in pairs, each pair dealing with a specific format, books, articles, then scores. In each pair, the participant chose a search tool for the first search, then we specified a tool for the second search. Books. Using a search tool of your choosing, find the English version of Schoenberg's treatise Harmony Lara. Second, in IUCAT, find the original language libretto for Rossini's Barber of Seville. Articles. Using a search tool of your choosing, find an article in English that discusses the use of clarinet in Mozart's operas. Second, using Rillum, find an article in English that discusses discusses Debussy's La Mer. Scores. Using a search tool of your choosing, find any score with parts for Bella Bartok's String Quartet No. 1, Op. 7, Salashi No. 40. In IUCAT, find any score of Il Mio Bel Foco by Benedetto Marcello. These items were carefully chosen to give searchers a challenge, something they would either have to have some previous knowledge about or do some deducing, and we wanted to find out which. While they were searching, I was watching along and asking probing questions to find out why they were doing what they were doing, or what they thought they were doing, and how they were coming to conclusions. You might be thinking that this sounds like a big project, and it was. Misty's gonna give you the fine print on what our budget was, then I'll come back to talk about our analysis process. For those of you who might want to conduct a study such as this, it may be useful to know about the costs. We spent $675 on participant incentives, so all 27 students received $25 cash for their participation. Transcription services were expensive. We spent a little over $2,600 for recordings to be transcribed because the typical fee for transcription is $1.45 per minute. We also purchased two software licenses so that we could use in vivo for analysis. Did we rob a bank? We did not. We're incredibly grateful for the support we received from IU Bloomington Libraries and especially to Andrew Asher, who contributed funds from his research account to assist in this study. We're also grateful to INULA, the IU Library Association, for giving us a grant that covered a fair bit of the costs. When it came to analysis, we were of many minds. We had a ton of very rich data, the creme brulee of music search data, so we wanted to get a lot out of it. For the sake of time, we decided that we could take a first pass through the search task videos and get something that would help us help students almost right away. Over the last few months, we've been watching searches to try and figure out where things go awry or where we could have intervened if we had the chance. We also tried to pinpoint moments when searchers use some kind of expertise in their search, music, language related, or library related. Misty and I sorted these moments into a schema of barriers and expertise that will likely grow and eventually form the basis of a more complex framework or structural analysis. So let's look at some of the barriers. I'll talk about books and scores. For every task, everyone was able to find something. I was happy that no one gave up. Many people completed all six tasks with a suitable item, and most found a suitable item for at least half the tasks. Those are pretty good odds. In the open internet searching, participants often look past the first result, which in the case of the Schoenberg text was exactly what they needed, though it was of questionable legality. We saw this happen in the catalog searching as well. This was rather unexpected since we thought students would assume the first result was what they needed. In the catalog searches, we saw issues with search terms. For example, including the term treatise with Schoenberg and Harmony Lara actually limited the number of results to just one. Deleting it brought 18 total results. 
This confirmed a widely held assumption that novice searchers don't quite understand how terms are used in catalog searches and how that process differs from engines like Google. A barrier that we entirely expected was lack of familiarity with terms or jargon, treatise, libretto, catalog numbers, even mini score. Some searchers sought out external information to fill in gaps, but even that only increased success some of the time. One completely unexpected barrier, at least for me, was searchers overthinking or thinking themselves out of a suitable item. For example, a student correctly explains what a libretto is before starting the search, but ultimately chooses a mini score. Talk about this more when we address limitations. Finally, one of the biggest barriers in finding scores in books was searchers not looking closely enough at the catalog record or insufficient evaluation, either navigating away from something useful or choosing something that doesn't fit the bill. This is an information literacy roadblock that we absolutely expected and that is likely the most difficult to address. And now, Misty will discuss barriers she observed in database searching for articles. I'm going to discuss barriers that I observed when students used databases in order to find articles. There are barriers that are specific to open-ended searches, barriers specific to RILM, and barriers that seem to appear no matter which database is used. First, I'm going to open with where I did not see barriers because it's nice to start with the positive. So students are generally fine with what they enter as keywords. Students are also very comfortable using limiters and facets, both for language and for format type. While students do rely on titles, so they'll click on a title whose keyword looks most relevant, nearly all students will then click into an article and study the bibliographic record or abstract to determine whether the article really addressed the topic. There is a major barrier I observed when students tried to fulfill these two questions to find articles. Students do not know what an article is, or they don't realize that we did specifically ask them to find an article from an academic journal. Often, a student selects a dissertation or a book and does not seem to notice or care that the selected formats are not articles. Sometimes a student knows that they're selecting a dissertation or a book, and they think these qualify as articles. One student narrates, an article is anything that discusses Lemaire, so dissertations count. One student uses format limiters for academic journals, conference papers, dissertations, and reviews in order to find articles, and narrates that articles means not a recording. A few students select books and academic journals as formats for articles, and one student indicates that a dissertation is a type of article. Sometimes a student assumes that what they're viewing is either a book or a chapter within a book, even when the words journal article appear above an item's title. Now, is this bad? Is this knowledge barrier important for instructors to try to mitigate? I think it depends. If you want your students to pick the right type of format for their information need, then this matters to you. If you're an instructor who just wants your students to find information, and then your students can deduce how to use that information, then maybe this knowledge barrier isn't a priority for you to lessen. Moving on to open-ended searches. What isn't a barrier? Let's start with that. So search tool selection is generally not a barrier when it comes to locating an item that qualifies. So those who chose Google, which is less than half of participants, or JSTOR, or Library OneSearch or MetaSearch were presented with relevant results near or at the top of the page. But when it comes to open-ended searches, there are pain points in the search experience that concern me. Students know that credibility matters, but they second-guess themselves about what credibility looks like. Students often start at the library's website but don't remember where to find their database or what it's called, and then they give up and they go to Google. A personal pain point for me, when studying Google results, students are not aware that the format of the item is going to dictate how they will access the full text of items that are behind paywalls. 
Just for fun, I wanted to say that my favorite quote from the open-ended search question came from a student who used Google and then saw a result from JSTOR and said, JSTOR, love it, ta-da. I think we all feel that way about JSTOR. And as a special aside, on more than one occasion when doing a Google open-ended search, a student would point out, ooh, a PDF, as though that's a siren call. Like they definitely recognize the PDF logo. Finally, I do want to address barriers I observed when students search RILIM. First, I feel it's important to point out that I think RILIM is an essential tool for music research. It is the most comprehensive, and I always, always devote time to teaching students to use RILIM. But in RILIM, the English language limiter does not work in predictable ways, and this leads to confusion concerning how to access the full text of an item. We knew that when students searched RILIM for the keywords WC Le Maire, that they would see results in French. So nearly all students immediately limited their results using the English option. And then nearly all students were confused when they saw many results in French. They do not realize that this is because if there is an abstract in English, that an item in French will still appear in the results. So here's what this looks like. After students use the English language limiter, they still saw these three titles, which are in French, right at the top of the search results. Here are some quotes from students when this happened to them. I thought I clicked on English. I'm confused because I thought I just selected English. I pared down the results using English and the first three results are still in French. That's weird. I know this is an article, but I cannot tell if this is translated into English. These came from different participants. Sometimes when this happened, students assumed that they made a mistake and they would try to limit again to English with results remaining the same, which was especially heartbreaking to witness. How much does this barrier matter? Well, if your students do not use RILIM, is this a barrier you should care about? I think yes, and here is why. This language limiter problem has given us insight into some of the assumptions that students make about items and languages they cannot read. For example, several students believe that if a title in French also has an English translation of the title below it, that means the item is available in both French and English. And the same goes for the abstract. The presence of an abstract in English means that the item is available in English. This assumption is something that we can see happening in any database whose coverage is global. So you might think that the worst case scenario is that a student will access the French item, realize it's not available in English, and then move on. But these barriers and pain points really pile up. Accessing the full text of an item can be very confusing, especially when link resolvers do not work how we want them to. So when a student has invested considerable time and energy into accessing something they can finally get their hands on but cannot read, they're less likely to use databases. And this matters because as we know, Google does not necessarily lead you to all of the academic literature that exists on a topic. So a takeaway for me is that in just about any instruction I do for databases, I'm going to devote some time to discussing strategies for finding literature and languages you can read. As for databases, I do think that in a perfect world, it would be much easier for a student to determine what the language is for the content of an item. Like, I wish that were the case. I did observe many other barriers to database research especially barriers related to accessing full text and in interpreting a bibliographic record. But we are out of time, so I'm going to hand things back to Will for the conclusion of our presentation. Before we invite questions and comments, I want to address a few limitations. First, you may have noticed that all the search tasks were about dead white guys. That was sort of on purpose because we wanted the subjects and concepts to be somewhat familiar to the searchers. I also mentioned earlier that some participants overthought or talked themselves out of something useful. The probing questions I asked almost definitely had an effect on the search process for some participants, and that should be considered.